Hello everyone, and as always, welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. And as you see, we hover over Pearl Harbor and the Hawaiian Islands. We're going to kick off another Let's Play of Warplan Pacific. Why am I doing that? Well, because one, I love this game. I, I actually think it is a fantastic game. It's so hard to capture the Pacific War, especially in a hex encounter game. Uh, but I really think that Alvaro Sousa, uh, the developer of this game, has just done a masterful job. Uh, now, I didn't play a whole lot of the original Warplan, Warplan Europe. I was just playing other things. I'm definitely going to go back and revisit it because if it's anywhere near as good as this, it should, you know, kind of replace uh, any board games that you go set out and actually clip counters because that's what this is and its essence is a board game but he does things just so well as far as the spacing uh, making for difficult choices uh, when you're trying to invade places you're trying to get from one port to another just the way he spaced the map uh, makes things very very challenging so who are we playing? What's going on? Well, I've played about 20 games of this now. Uh, no joke. I like the game that much. Um, and I I was beaten once, and I, it bothered me. <laughs> no, I, the very, very good Japanese player, uh, Bonsai83, uh, I resigned. I had to resign the game. And... Uh, I was like, wow, I, I've never seen someone play the jack. You know, like I said, I've played this now quite a bit, probably as much as anybody. And i had never seen a Japanese player play so aggressively and constantly have me on the back foot. And so uh, once that game ended, I, I said, wow, let's do this again. And, you know, do you mind if I record it? Because I know a lot of people are very interested in how to play the Japanese side. And rather than me spend, you know, the next couple of months kind of learning all of the ins and outs of playing the Japanese side, I thought, hey, let's let's kick this off again. It's going to be a chess match. Now, I can tell you uh, from the previous game, one wrong slip up, one wrong move on our part. Uh, it's just like chess. It, it's going to it causes an avalanche of problems. And so we're going to have to play really, really well to win. When I say really well, we're going to have to play close to perfect to win this rematch. Now, luckily, I've learned a lot of things from the first play by email uh, that we did on the channel. And uh, no offense to that player, but, you know, I think he was new to the game. And, you know, we sort of had our way in that one. Um, that is not going to be the case here. We're going to have to do everything right. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to try to impart some of the things I've learned from playing the game, you know, as much as I have now at this point, uh, sort of the optimal way to play the allies. And then I'll be showing you all of his moves to show you a very, very smart way to play the Japanese side. Now, I think we're going to win this one. But we'll see. We'll see. Even if we do, it's going to be close. It'll be right down to the last few moves uh, because this is a player that definitely knows how to play the Axis Japanese side. Um, so let's kick it off. I mean, if you watched the previous play by email, I'm not going to go through, you know, how to move your units and stuff. Uh, this is going to be more of a kind of, a, you know, moderate to advanced uh, sort of play by email. I'm going to touch upon the high points. We're not going to sit and discuss every single last, you know, movement of a counter. Um, we are going to talk a lot of strategy. We're going to talk again about things that I think I've learned from playing the allied side, the best way to go about it. All right. So he has started off. He's done his play one. Uh, and like any good Japanese player, I say play one, turn one, turn one. Let's just go over to the Dutch East Indies, all right? And as you can see, what he's done is he's come out here and immediately taken Java, all right? So he's taken the Netherlands East Indies. He's taken Batavia. He didn't even go to Surabaya. 
no reason to. When you take Batavia, you're going to then uh, force the Dutch surrender, which he did. So, you know, when you're playing a player that's not as experienced or, or someone that maybe doesn't quite understand the intricacies of the game, like our last game, they won't take Batavia right off the bat on turn one. And when they don't, you can do things. You can fly things around. You can get things out, uh, such as, you know, the air unit in the Philippines. Last time I was able to fly it down to Monado and get it out eventually. And that gives us a free air unit. Uh, a player that is advanced like this is not going to allow that to happen. So, of course, he's right in on Singapore. Um, it's really almost impossible for a Japanese player to take Singapore on turn one. I'm not saying it's completely impossible, but I have not seen it yet. You know, I don't want to say something's impossible. I guess, you know... Maybe maybe it isn't because I just haven't seen that yet. But you can see here he moved in on Singapore very quickly. He took Batavia. You always want to do that as a Japanese player. He immediately, and he is very good at this, and you'll see this as the game goes on. He's actually excellent at interdicting ports. And it's a part of the game that I think that uh, most beginning and intermediate players struggle with a little bit uh not going to be the case in this game he will immediately come and interdict ports early in the game because he knows that our naval power cannot counter him if we move our carriers out or if we move anything out here he's got two carrier groups that are stronger than anything we can put on the board, even if we combine all of our units, right? So he can bully us in the sea, and a big part of that is naval interdiction. You see he's interdicted Lingayan here. He's interdicted Manila. He's already landed at Legaspi and Apari. He's coming here in a hurry, and there's no way for us to get this air unit out of here. There's nowhere to take it. I mean, we could take it to DeVoe, but then there's no place to skip it from there. So he's done for this air unit. The best we can hope for is to try to, you know, hit a ship uh, with the bomber. You know, that's what we're going to try to do. If we go up here to China, you'll see he has moved at lightning speed in China. And this is another mistake that I see... Uh, kind of beginning Japanese players make is they don't move fast enough in China. Uh, the Japanese have got to get after it in China. They have got to push, push, push. Otherwise, this starts to become a stalemate if you let the Chinese forces set up, right? And so it becomes a decision for the allied player. Do you bring things back here to Kunming and try to defend Kunming? Do you bring them here to Chongqing and Chengdu? Now, this would be the traditional way to come, you know, to come defend. The problem is it's not the best defensible terrain. You've got a lot of clear terrain once they get past the mountains here. Um, whereas down in Kunming, or Kunming, it's a lot of mountains, uh, mountainous territory. Now, the problem is if you lose Kunming, you don't have anything else. At least if you lose Chongqing, you can drop back to Cheng Tu. Uh, there are no good options. Now, he was the first player where I've ever actually lost China uh, because the speed of movement here, uh, I tried to play as I did against other people and set up a defensive line. And, and you know, by then he was, ba he was past me. And then you just get so on the defensive that you're constantly just react, 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 and you're never dug in. You have got to get, you know, you've got to dig into two spades worth. So a level two entrenchment to have any chance out here. So we'll come back to that. In India, I also lost India to him eventually. That was a little more of a fight, but... Again, I was a little too slow to react to the speed of his advancement. I was playing like I was playing against other people, which is, oh, well, one of these turns, he's going to take a break. We'll set our line. That never happened. It just kept coming steamroller style. I've also learned a few things, I think, about defense 
and the best way to defend certain places, uh, to defend against landings. The main thing on defense you don't want to ever allow to happen is to get surrounded by three sides. For a good unit, uh, it is very, very difficult to knock that unit. Now, this isn't a particularly good unit, but for a good unit, it's very difficult to knock out a unit unless you have it surrounded on three sides. Uh, one thing I really learned in this game and a few others is you need to double, not double stack in the same hex, but you need to have one other unit off the shoulder of a unit in a port, you know, in a town, in a in a port that the uh, other player is going to come try to take. If you want to defend that, you need to put it right off the shoulder, uh, and that way it makes it almost impossible to surround this unit on three sides. And this game is all about surrounding units on three sides. It's the real way to get an advantage in this game. Okay, uh, so Chit Chat, you know, he's got his Navy over here on this side. Why is that? Well, he's probably got invasion forces heading this way. Uh, he gets to India very quickly, or at least he did last game. And his main goals seem to be, he takes Burma very quickly, of course, but the main goals seem to be taking China, taking India, and then we just battled like hell down in Australia. But if you're the Allied player battling down in Australia, that's a real problem for you because once he takes India and China, he's got so much production then that he didn't have before that he almost gets on equal footing with you from a production perspective. And you start seeing Japanese units that you never would, you know, just a, the number of Japanese units you see is not something you would nor, nor in a normal game, believe me. Uh, he's already, well, we're just floating around the map. He came immediately and took Lei. He immediately came and attacked Rabal. Uh, those have both, you know, been taken. He didn't quite land on Rabal yet. He could only get somebody here on the fringe. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about landing and invasions in this game. Uh, it's so important that you get those right. You see he's already interdicted Moresby. Uh, he's not down at Nomaya yet. That's actually smart. There's no reason to be. We don't have any transports, so we can't get this unit off of here even, you know, if we wanted to. Eventually, he'll come down here and interdict Nomaya. Don't worry about that. That is coming. Um, <laughs> so believe me, he also just forgets about Suva at the start. Uh, and I see a lot of beginning players uh, go right for Nomaya or Suva uh, and try to do it that way. Um, the only advantage of him not taking Suva is we can get this air unit out. So if he does come interdict this port, we cannot get the air unit out. He decided not to do that. Now, this is the infamous unit that never wants to upgrade ever. And, and I think he's played the allies enough. He knows that this is not really a dangerous air unit for him. He did come to interdict Pago Pago and Tonga. So those are interesting choices, right? He comes and gets the easternmost of these islands. He leaves Nomaya and Suva. I can tell you from the previous game, it's a pretty good strategy. It's a pretty good strategy. Okay, so we, we've discussed all that. Uh, let's just go through our screens like we usually do. We'll have to stop, talk about our advancements, and kind of what I feel like I've learned. You'll be very interested to see the build and how we're going to do it this time uh, because it's completely different than how I've done it before. Deployment, uh, there's nothing to deploy now. Obviously, we're in turn one, uh, but we'll just kind of click through here. Uh, the main thing... I wanted to point out, uh, and you know this if you watched the first one or if you watched other games, is uh, India gets its first new unit March 1st. That is kind of our ticking deadline is March 1st. If we play well, he should still be stuck in India a little bit uh, on March 1st enough to hopefully get British troops there or even American troops, which I've done in other games, over to India the minute we get transports. And we do not get them until March. Uh, so this Indian unit can be very, very helpful. 
Um, you know, Philippines, obviously New Zealand has nothing. Uh, Communist China was very big in our last game. He eventually took them uh, because the rest of the nationals, Chinese army had been destroyed at that point. Uh, but man, they, ha they hung on for a long time. Having the Chinese up in the hills uh, back there by Lan Chao is very important. Um, okay, U.S., let's look at this just very quickly. Our first transport arrives March 1st. That's why I say this is the deadline for the Japanese player. Uh, from what I can tell so far, I can tell you on March 1st, 1942, whether the Japanese player has a chance or not. Uh, they have got to pretty much be all the way through India at that point. They have to have you in a bad, bad shape in China, and they have to really be threatening Australia, uh, obviously have taken Burma. So, you know, you can really tell a lot on March 1st when the Allies start getting transports. Now, one problem I had in early games uh, that I played, now it didn't really cost me much until I got to this game, um, or against this player, is building transports. So the first thing we're going to do and over the first few turns with the United States uh, is build transports. And that's it. B transports and landing craft. That's it. We're not even going to build units. You will have enough units. Start off building transports and landing craft. That, that's the key. Also, have your secondaries like the Canadians build transports and landing craft for the British. Uh, the Brits do not have much in the way of logistics. If we look over here at logistics, they've only got 150 left. You know, uh, that is not a lot. And so their shipyards are all being used. They've only got 150 in logistics. You've got to put that into troops. Their troops are a lot better than any of the other allied troops other than the, well, they're even better than the U.S. at the start. Uh, and so what you've got to do is take some of these secondary countries, potentially New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. So let's look at Canada. Canada has almost no logistics. You could build two divisions, right, with 20 logistics. Um, instead of doing that, go over here to uh, transports and landing ships, and as you see, they take no logistics. So now you do have a problem with manpower because these cost 10 manpower, uh, but landing ships only cost five manpower. And so you can build six landing ship groups with the Canadians. Uh, that's just something that over time they started to become apparent to me is the Canadians, uh, potentially the Kiwis, although you do need at one Kiwi division, uh, you need to build a third one. They've got two at the start. You should build a third one and beef up um, uh, Auckland. You should put that, you know, uh, combine it with that other division, put it in Auckland. Okay, uh, let's go. So that's deployment. Let's go to the combat log for last time. He started off with a carrier strike, obviously, at Pearl Harbor. I don't think that surprises you. Uh, and we can get a little sense of what his carrier groups look like uh, attacking carriers. He's got six of them. Uh, he took one AA loss. That's it. Uh, we took a lot of battleship losses, but nothing sunk the first time around. All right. Carrier strike the second time around. Uh, he took an AA loss again. Uh, actually, this wasn't terrible. Uh, I've seen much worse at Pearl Harbor. He got a destroyer squadron, and he bottomed the Maryland. Well, the Maryland will come back. Uh, we are beaten up, and when we go look at this, a lot of these have one point, uh, two points out of the four that you get for battleships. Uh, so they're in bad shape, uh, but we really only lost the destroyer. And the Maryland's bottomed, but we can fix that. Invasion, Batavia. This is where he goes immediately. Uh, he, you know, lands here, takes one loss. Uh, land combat at Cota Baru. So he hits immediately at Cota Baru. This unit just surrenders. Uh, throws up its hands. Uh, also surrenders at Taipang. Uh, land combat at Batavia just surrenders there. It was just too much strength. He had the 11th and 12th NLF uh, and the Yokosuka, second NLF. So he hit this with three full marine type units. Um, he also had carrier ground support. So his carriers are over here hitting and bombing 
there as well. Air unit was overrun out here. <coughs> Our fleet retreated. Uh, he then landed at uh, near Apari, uh, naval air striking Manila. He did sink the Houston. So the cruiser Houston is sunk. Naval airstrike, the skipjack, the submarine squadron uh, took two. Land combat. Uh, he immediately moves out of Hong Kong and attacks here with his strongest unit. Now, he is the only Japanese player I've ever seen do this for whatever reason. Uh, when you really think about it, this makes all the sense in the world. He's got a nine attack value here. There, we cannot just go land in Hong Kong. You know, I mean, we don't have anything that can even you know, we could move down here and try to get to Hong Kong, but he can just turn around and blast us out with, you know, whatever unit we put down there. So I think a lot of Japanese players are scared to move this out of Hong Kong. Like, oh my gosh, what if we lose Hong Kong? Well, you're not going to lose Hong Kong. And so he's come up here and immediately smashed us, just absolutely shattered that unit. Uh, land combat here, you know, he took some losses a couple air and land uh we immediately had to retreat uh land combat here again right outside of cheng sha he's immediately coming for cheng sha and just poof, you know obliterated us there uh, we're gonna have to do a lot of thinking about how we want to handle china here uh land combat we actually held for a turn uh, then we had to retreat. Naval airstrike on Singapore, the 11th flotilla took two. The Prince of Wales, do, 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 do. Prince of Wales goes down. Naval airstrike, nothing happened in there. Naval airstrike, uh, he took one damage. Okay. Naval airstrike, the Repulse took two in this one, but stayed afloat. Uh, the Repulse is still out there kicking. Invasion at Rabal, and he, you know, knocked our unit out of here. We shattered. Uh, he'll get into that next turn. Invasion, uh, Legaspi. So he's down here uh, in the southern part of the Philippines. And then we've got another invasion up here at Kuala Balat, uh, another one at Guam. And finally, he landed here at Leh uh, and just took Leh. So that's the state. Uh, that's the kind of aggressiveness we're talking about. He's also interdicting Moresby, as you see here. On the current turn, we've got partisan activity because of course we do. Uh, I will say in the last game, he had moved so fast out of his garrisons that we got some partisan uh, units on the map and we overran uh, one of his air units, uh, which I think was a, a nasty surprise. He, he messaged me, uh, but I think he'll know better this time. All right, supply interdiction. So he's interdicting Moresby. Moresby is a level three port. Let's see what we see here. He's got two ships in the area. So it's just interdiction. It's not completely cut off yet. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Where did this go? Oh, where was I? Yeah, combat log. Okay. Supply interdiction. Okay. Well, he's just naturally doing this at Kavang. Uh, supply interdiction at Rubble. Okay. Uh, I don't know what else he's got down here. Do we have any one ship? This is one battleship he brought down here. Eight ships in the area. This has probably got some car light carriers anyway. Uh, we're seeing two ships there. All right. Uh, I think now we'll just go through our warnings. Um, no supply source. Oh, he is interdicting Midway. Okay. Two subs in the area. It's a level two port. So he's going to completely uh, take, you know, no supply source at Midway. Uh, no supply source at Manila. Now, one thing he's really good at is bringing these smaller patrol ships to do interdiction uh, work on us here. And as you can see, he's uh, interdicting Manila, Manila there. Uh, he's also out here at Canton, uh, providing no supply source, so we have none. And also Pago Pago. So he went to the American bases and to Tonga, and you can see up to Wake as well. So he's everywhere with interdiction. He did a great job in the first game, and he's doing a great job here of using those naval interdiction um, rules to make sure we don't have supply 
and essentially starving these units out so he doesn't have to come and take them with land forces. Uh, it's really the way to play as the Japanese. So if we back up, um, you can really see it here. Interdiction, interdiction, interdiction. And then he's got it down here at Tonga as well. So as you can see, he's trying to get a little closer to the Hawaiian Islands. He knows he can always come back here and get, you know, no Maya or Suva. Okay. Who else has no supply source? All right. He's also interdicting Lingayan. Uh, Manila again. Surubaya has no supply source. Right. That I mean, they were cut off and now they're just gone because the Dutch surrendered. No supply source at Singapore. Uh, we None at Bandar Lampung, but they've already surrendered. Uh, same with Madan um out here at rabal but that's now gone port supply interdiction you can see uh partisans here we go all right those were our warnings okay let's go down the map combat log we looked at reports we'll be coming back and looking at this a lot more you can see sunk ships we lost the prince of wales do 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 um war panel all right, we'll be coming back to this and looking at victory points because this game should really go down to the wire. Uh, and it's all going to be about those victory points. So that'll be fun to watch. Advancements. All right. The Brits, uh, you know, the Indians have some anti-tank, but really the Brits, for the most part, I leave anti-tank on one now and I move their assault to six. Because really, with the British, it's all going to be, it's good. we're going to be building assault units. Um, you know, I, I've just found that's the best way to go with the Brits. Ultimately, the Brits are always going to be on the offense. I mean, if you think about it, uh, now you may say, well, uh, that's not true. What about Australia and India? Well, yeah, but against a really good player, you will have lost most of that by the time you even have transports. And so the biggest thing then is to get troops that can land somewhere and do some damage. So if we look at the assault next time, firearms, you know, when we go to 43, firearms will go up, then artillery, then firearms again. So our medium range guns here never get better with the assault uh it's really all going to be the firearms the close in and the artillery a little further out as you can see with anti-tank the medium gets better then the long range gets better then the medium gets better again so this is more assault you're right on top of them you're attacking you want those firearms to be better so um we're going to have six and one with the u.s we won't even do any anti-tank we're not going to do any armor with the Brits. They don't have the logistics to support it. Doesn't make any sense. We're also not going to do any air with the Brits. Uh, they they just don't have, it's not worth it. Uh, you do have an Indian interceptor unit. We will actually put that on one. Uh, but the rest of this, you don't need it. Uh, we will leave close support on one, but the Brits are going to be doing no strategic bombing. Naval air training I go back and forth on this one every damn time. Um, but with the Brits, it's really going to be about warships at the start. Um, let's back that off. Four and four, five and five. Okay. You also want to be doing carrier operations because late in the game, the Brits do a lot of carrier stuff. So amphibious, carrier, um... Oh, let's just take that up to a seven. All right. So that's how I break down the Brits. Usually they've got a couple of close support units. They're not even the British ones, though. It's it's uh, the Australians have a close support. New Zealand will have one. So we put that on a one. They do have some Indian anti-tank units. So we'll put that on a one. Um, uh, I'm tempted, actually this time around we probably mm, let's actually put that back at a six and we'll do the naval air training at one or let's do two let's do two and two so you can see where our main focuses are here it's all on the naval and the infantry for the brits 
uh, and really they get their navel much later in the game, and you just want to have really be really prepared for it. They also have warships, obviously, right at the start. Uh, for the U.S., this one's pretty easy. We take an off anti-tank. We go, whoops, we go as high as we can on assault, which is at the start's only a six. Uh, we get off of heavy armor. We do a two for breakthrough. Why is that? The mechanized units you can get for the U.S. are super powerful once you build this up. Those mechanized cores can go and wreak havoc in clear hexes. Now, so across Australia, across India and a lot of parts, those you want to go ahead and build that up now interceptors i've gone back and forth and back and forth about how to do the air ultimately the air is ultra important for the us but i do back off interceptors to a four um, escort fighters we are going to use them later in the game for bombing the japanese homeland you've got to have their range they have a much jumped up range you can see it goes from a three to a nine you know goes up plus nine over their natural range in 1944 i was never building these before and then i got to a game where i was trying to bomb the homeland uh, the Japanese homeland, and I had nothing to escort those bombers in, and they got chewed up. And I was like, well, okay, let's go look at the escorts. Then I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, they really get a big range, and you want to bomb them out of, uh, you know, this area, or really the best place to do it when you have that better range is right over here in Southeast Asia. Uh, so escort, uh, fighter bombers are what I really focus on now. Uh, I know that there were comments on the last play by email that, hey, you should probably be doing more of that. Well, uh, that was a very early game that I played. And over time, you know, I read that comment and kind of chuckled because I was like, yeah, you were right back then. Uh, the fighter bombers, very important to the U.S. Why is that? Well, they've got... Um, Pretty decent air combat by the time you get to 45, tact, you know, or even 44, they've got good uh, tactical bombing. They kind of do it all, right? They've got a range of eight, uh, generally, fighter bombers do. So it's better than the interceptors, which is only a six. Uh, but you can also then bomb something. So it's just dual role. I mean, I know it's in the name. I'm just explaining. It's a dual role. It's not quite as good as interceptors and not quite as good as close support bombers. Uh, but it does a little bit of everything. It's a jack of all trades. We are going to go up to a four for close support. And Early on, we're going to back off strategic bombing to a two. Now, we will bump that up later, but not for now. We're going to leave naval air and submarine on two. That's fine. We're going to put naval warships, give that one more point. So that's three and three. And then we're going to really bump up carrier operations, put that on a five. And I used to always do long-range subs, and then I kind of now have changed my mind. Um, now you start with nothing but long range subs. The U S subs don't even take them out of port until 1943. Basically they're worthless. Uh, worthless is too strong, but they will get destroyed because the Japanese just have too many, too many air assets and too many carriers. They will find them. They will bomb them. They will destroy them. And those submarines aren't doing you any good anyway. They, do, they don't have, uh, the torpedoes are screwed up. We've talked about that before, but they don't have enough to, to even, you know, knock out a merch Marine or an escort before 1943 anyway. Also always hunt, always have them hunt in wolf packs. Always, always. It, it doesn't make any sense to send out one sub unless you do what Bonsai 83 did here. And that is, if we scoot across here, they're good for interdicting ports if you know there's no air power there. Okay, so he knows there is no air power at Wake Island. It's beautiful to use these then to interdict the port. If we had a bomber here, though, or a bomber, fighter bomber, bomber tactical group, then we could just bomb the living heck out of him. But there's no way we're going to bring our carriers out here to take on, you know, some subs and he knows that so anyway um i've gone back and forth sometimes i'm like well the subs are 
half worthless anyway. I think in this game, I actually will just go with the long range subs. I'm going to bump that down to a four though. And I'm going to put up, so carrier operations and infantry are the, the headliners for the Americans, uh, but they do a little bit of everything. Uh, wait a minute. Hold on. Let's back this up for one second because I do need to do some amphib. All right, we'll actually make them five and five and we'll make amphib two. You've got to be good. You know, you cannot be taking penalties as the Americans doing amphibious landings. So with amphib, as you can see, the real bonus is getting them to 1943. That makes it, you know, only a 15% chance you'll take any damage. Uh, you got to get it up to that. So it's a little more spread out than I would, you know, like it to be, but that's the hard choices you have to make in this game. Um, you know, we've got to have our warships and large warships be better. Uh, we've got to do a little bit of the naval and anti-sub. That also helps your carriers and your other surface ships. And then you've got to do a little bit of the air. Now we could get out of interceptors, Oh, now see, I'm talking myself out of things. Let's let's do it for this game. Let's do it. Um, I actually sounded very confident there, didn't I? Uh, but I think I'm going to do nothing but build fighter bombers and close support this time. So let's actually bump those back up, uh, and we'll. Go back and forth. He goes back and forth. Um, sorry. Now I'm now I'm thinking. Now I'm thinking. Um, six can't go any higher there. We could take carrier operations to a seven, but I don't want to do that. What I'm doing is contemplate whether to take this to a three. Because it's just important you get there fast. All right, I think I'm going to do that. It's kind of worthless later on, unfortunately. Uh, with the Soviets, I just always leave it the same. I've yet to have the Soviets come into a game. You may find that shocking. Uh, interceptors, all we're going to do with the Chinese. Oh, there we go. We can get that to a four, and we can get interceptors to a four. Almost all of the Chinese troops are assault. Uh, interceptors, you know it's that's the flying tigers we could bump that down to a two and take the anti-tank to a two because the communist chinese have nothing but anti-tank so let's just do that we'll do that um all right so that's it for advancements convoys i've really kind of changed this up a little bit i used to be all about man let's get everything into australia and india that we can but in many ways the most important convoys that you make are the us to to the uk uh and so with this one we're gonna send them uh three oil uh, i always do either two or three let's do three all right, and then we're going to control and we're going to send uh, the Brits like 25. Now, you don't want to go over the top because the Brits just don't have that much logistics, but you want them to get you want to get them started. Right. So U.S. to U.K. That will also use U.K. Uh, merchant Marines. That's just how the game works. Uh, usually it's the sender merchant marines when it goes us to uk it's uk merchant marines i'm fine with that uh let's go back to the brits uh east bay of bengal is not going to matter uh the brits we put them all in the indian ocean uh the west bay of bengal is not going to really matter i mean calcutta is going to get taken pretty quickly um west bay of bengal okay we will put these in at two East Bay of Bengal is Calcutta. This is Colombo. So we'll do uh, a two, right? Am I right? Wait a minute. Did I just say that wrong? Hold on. Uh, I just want to go. Yeah, this is West Bay of Bengal. This is, oh, that's still West Bay of Bengal. Okay. Well, that works out well. Uh, I guess it's into Rangoon. Okay, into Rangoon is East Bay of Bengal. Okay, well, we just care about the West 
Bay of Bengal, we're going to lose Rangoon very, very quickly. Then with the U.S., of course, we put all of, uh, you know, put 10 into the South Pacific. Uh, they've got two left over. You know, we could put them in the Indian Ocean, I guess. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's put those two there. Then we can take out two of these and put them in the West Bay of Bengal. Okay. Uh, now we've got 10 in the South Pacific, 10 in the Indian Ocean, and whatever's left over in the West Bay of Bengal. We'll have to watch this. Uh, you know, eventually we'll put the Brits, you know, we'll have these extra from the Brits. We'll put them in the Indian Ocean. Um, the Brits, I do not have send anywhere, anybody, anything, uh, including India. Uh, I just don't see the upside of it. Uh, eventually, you know, India may fall anyway. Uh, the Brits need all they can get at the start. Uh, the U.S., I do have sent some things to Australia uh, because usually you're going to hold on to Australia uh, much longer, much longer. So the U.S. can send one oil. We will also send some oil out to New Zealand eventually, uh, but not right now. Uh, and then the U.S. will send, I usually send like 20 to Australia at the start anyway. Uh, and try to get them another unit as fast as we can. I could even bump that maybe to a 25 as well, uh, and we'll just create that. So 25 and 1. U.S. is sending out 50 at the start uh, for oil. Sometimes I'll do U.K. 2, and then I'll give New Zealand 1 as well on the oil, on the oil. Okay, so that's our trading. I mean, there's nothing else to really do here, obviously. Uh, the Soviets and the Chinese are not going to be... Uh, doing other convoys so we've done that now let's go to the build queue all right so what has changed or what is my how is my thinking changed on the build queue uh well first of all the uk can't really build anything the first turn except for landing ships uh and so if we look down at the east african bases the uk has a division down here and a headquarters okay uh that's about it they've got some ships uh, they've also got a headquarters up here by Delhi, um, and they've got whatever's left once Singapore has been bombed. So all in all, not a whole lot, not a whole lot. Um, so what do you do starting off immediately start building landing ships, um, and transports if you can. Now, in this case, we can't, um, and with the UK, given their logistics situation, really, I like to build those with the Australians, the Canadians, the Kiwis, as I mentioned. Uh, and so if we look at Australia's logistics, they actually have, you know, 180, not a bad number. I mean, if the game goes on and, and your opponent hasn't taken uh, Canberra and Sydney and Melbourne, you can really crank out a lot of units. But where is your real manpower? It's in India. Uh, if you have a game go along where, you know, let's say the Japanese player never gets past Calcutta, you will overwhelm him with Indian units. That's why it's so important for him to get units into India as fast as he can and take as much as he can. Uh, but we're going to try to defend it the best we can. We'll probably not be able to save India unless we can get British troops up here in time. Uh, but on turn one, we are not able, let's go to the Brits, we are not able to build an infantry division. I mean, we're just not. We're going to have to wait another turn. So what are we going to build? We're going to go to landing ships and we'll build, oh, we don't have ship, shipyards. I always forget that. All right. So next turn, to the extent shipyards open up, we'll build transports and landing ships. Uh, but next turn, we'll get that division cooking for the UK. Uh, they naturally get 40 in transports. I found in this game that the UK really needs to have probably 60 uh, transports, and the US needs to have about 150. Once you get to those levels, uh, you're usually pretty good. You're not going to really run out of them unless you've created so many units in India and Australia. Uh, then the UK needs a lot more transports and landing ships than that, probably up to 100 on transports. But early game, it's really 60. So nothing to build here for the UK. We go to the US. We go to support. 
Uh, as you can see, they've only got 28 in shipyard, but that's okay. Uh, we will build two transports. Purchase. Transport times 10 built. And transport times 10 built. All right. Can we get any landing ships? Production shipyard? Yep, we can build one. All right. And so now we've got a landing ship built. Uh, that will take up our shipyards until things start cranking out. Now, next time we get uh, all of those U.S. carriers, not next time, the turn after we get all the U.S. carriers out, it's like they're coming out of the shipyard and a lot of this will open up. But on turn one now for the U.S., all I do is build transports and landing ships. It's, it's you know, that that's the way I go about it. Um, Soviet Union. Not, nothing you can do there. China, nothing to do. Australia, Canada, uh, Communist China, India, New Zealand, Philippines. Nothing to do there. Nothing to do there. Uh, the only other derivation I'll do with the U.S. sometimes is I'll build two trans. Always build the transports, but instead of that landing ship, uh, we could back that up and we could build a division. But you've got already just starting you've got a good number of u.s forces um i go back and forth about that all the time i don't know let's you know and plus it starts as a 41 let's do a division um and we'll start building landing ships next time after i went past that i thought gosh i can't remember in the last couple of games i think i've done it this way uh, if we look at the deployment screen for the U.S., they get their first transport March 1st. As you can see, you know, they naturally just get divisions and cores, whatever. Uh, they just get a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of ships, you know, you're going to have to build most of your own infantry. You should never have to build a battleship or a carrier. Those will all arrive naturally for the UK. You can see they get some battleships, the Romelis, the Valiant. Um, when we start moving, to, and it's but it's not till 1944 they get all of their carriers. <gasps> uh, when we start moving things around, you'll see that I, I get the British Navy completely out of here. Uh, but I'm going to save that for the next time. We're going to move our units around uh, and get them positioned on the map. Anyway, this has been Strategy Gaming Dojo. I hope you're finding this helpful to see what the Japanese do, what a good Japanese player does. As you can see, he interdicts uh, a lot of these ports. Uh, now, not these so much. These are straight up invasions, but like Moresby, uh, you know, and out here into the Pacific, you know, he gets Pago Pago interdicted. Uh, it's just stuff we don't have an answer for, unfortunately. So when we come back next time, we're going to make our moves. Uh, we'll talk a lot about how to set up your defense, uh, what I think the best and most efficient way to do that is. Anyway, this has been Strategy Gaming Dojo. Have a great one. I'll talk to you next time.